And gentlemen, we have a question here from CNNPolitics.com. Without caveats or explanations, please define yourself using one word and one word only. Mr. Speaker. Cheerful. <laughs> right. That's... Well, when I was Speaker, as I'm sure he remembers, we balanced the budget for four consecutive years for the only time in his lifetime. So I think that's a good place to start with uh, Gilbert's question. We're meeting tonight on the 280th anniversary of George Washington's birth. You go back and look at the Founding Fathers. They'd have had very clear messages. <clears throat> Hamilton would have said, you have to have jobs and economic growth to get back to a balanced budget. You're never going to balance the budget on the back of a highly unemployed country. And so I would be committed, first of all, to a program of jobs and economic growth. Second, the energy issue is enormous. Uh, the leading developer of North Dakota oil estimated recently that if we would open up federal land and open up offshore, you would have 16 to 18 trillion, not billion, trillion dollars in royalties to the federal government in the next generation. An enormous flow which would drive down prices to 250 a gallon, would help us balance the budget, and would create millions of jobs. Finally, I agree generally with the need to reform government. I think that if we were prepared to repeal the 130-year-old civil service laws, go to a modern management system, we could save a minimum of $500 billion a year with a better system. And if we then applied the Tenth Amendment, as Governor Rick Perry has agreed to head up a project on, I think we can return to the states an enormous share of the power that's currently in Washington, D.C. Congressman. Cheerful. <laughs> well, look, first of all, I think that Governor Romney today moved in the right direction. And I think that that's a serious step towards trying to find a closer to supply side. I wouldn't agree with him on capping capital gains cuts at 200,000, because I think that's frankly economically destructive and I don't believe in class warfare and that's a number below Obama's class warfare number so we can argue later about capital gains cuts but I think there's a different question everybody talks about managing the current government the current government is a disaster I mean we don't you know this is it is the reason I started with with the idea that came out of strong America now to repeal the 130-year-old civil service laws and go to a modern management system is you change everything. And the fact is, if we're serious, and, and in a funny kind of way, Ron and I are closer on the scale of change, uh, we'd approach it slightly different, but I think you've got to start and say, what would a modern system be like? And a modern system would be totally, just, just take control of the border. It is utterly stupid to say that the United States government can't control the border. It's a failure of will. It's a failure of enforcement. So let me just take that one example. Let's assume you could tomorrow morning have a president who wanted to work with your governor, who instead of suing Arizona, helped Arizona, who actually worked with Arizona. Now, what's the fiscal reality three years from now in your emergency rooms in your schools, in your prisons, of controlling the border. It's a lot less expensive. You just took a major step towards a less expensive future. So I think it is possible to modernize the federal government and cut taxes and develop energy simultaneously. And the three lead you to Gilbert's concern. Let's get back to a balanced budget. Cheerful. <laughs> right. That's... Well, look, let me just say flatly. All of you need to think about this, because this is one of those easy demagogic fights that gets you in a lot of trouble. If you have Barack Obama as president, and you have a Republican House, you, want you may want the House imposing certain things on the president. Now, when I was Speaker, for example, and we had a liberal Democrat in the White House, I actually want to reinforce what the governor said. I helped the Atlanta Olympics get the support they needed from the U.S. government to be successful. I thought it was totally appropriate to help the United States. And I actually went to, uh, to uh, your former governor and sat down with the people originally planning the Winter Olympics and said, look, this is what we did. This is what you need to do. I think it was totally appropriate for you to ask for what you got. I just think it's kind of silly for you to then turn around and run an ad attacking somebody else for getting what you got and then claiming what you got wasn't what they got because what you got was right and what they got was wrong.
But, but cheerful. <laughs> but that's. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. It's a major American industry at a time of trouble. That's not a tough. It's not tough, you say. It's not tough. First of all, there was a huge amount of the American auto industry that was just fine. BMW in South Carolina was terrific. <laughs> Mercedes in Alabama was doing just fine. Honda in Ohio was just fine. So the Toyota was just fine. What we have is a United Auto Workers and a management system that had grown very, I think, incapable of tough decisions because they were used to selling out to the United Auto Workers. And so they came in and said, oh, we can't change. And this president, on behalf of the United Auto Workers, said, you're exactly right. Now, the fact is Chrysler is now fiat. So when we talk about saving the American auto industry, let's be clear what they were doing. I think that they would have been much better off to have gone through a managed bankruptcy. I agree with Governor Romney. I think it would have happened. I think but what would have happened is the UAW would have lost all of their advantages. And the result was what you had, I thought, was an unprecedented violation of 200 years of bankruptcy law by Barack Obama to pay off the UAW at the expense of every bondholder. So, uh, cheerful. <laughs> well, the reports we got were, on, were quite clear that the public health department was prepared to give a waiver to Catholic hospitals about a morning after abortion pill, and that the governor's office issued explicit instructions saying that they believed it wasn't possible under Massachusetts law to give them that waiver. Now, that, that was the newspaper reports that, that came out. Uh, that's something that both Senator Santorum and I have raised before. But, but I want to go a step further, because this makes a point that, that uh, Ron Paul's been making for a generation and that, that people need to take very seriously. When you have government as the central provider of services, you inevitably move towards tyranny because the government has the power of force. You inevitably, and I think this is true whether it's Romney Care or Obamacare or any other government centralized system, you inevitably move towards the coercion of the state and the state saying, if you don't do what we, the politicians, have defined, you will be punished, either financially or you'll be punished in some other way, like going to jail. And that's why we are, I think, at an enormous crossroads in this country. And, and I think the fact is, for almost all of us who have been at this for any length of time, we are now looking at an abyss that forces you to change what you may once have thought. And I suspect all four of us are much more worried today about the power of the state uh, than we would have been, with the possible exception of Congressman Paul, than we would have been at any point in the last 25 years. Cheerful. <laughs> but, that's, the, fence, the fence has been a, port, a point of contention in the race, and one of your high-profile supporters, a gentleman who's been up here during this campaign, Governor Rick Perry of Texas, is here tonight. And he said this, if you build a 30-foot wall from El Paso to Brownsville, the 35-foot ladder business gets really good. <laughs> Uh, uh, you signed a pledge to construct a double fence. Why is Governor Perry wrong? He's not wrong. They did have to have two 35-foot ladders because it's a double fence. <laughs> uh, look, the, the fact is I helped Duncan Hunter pass the first fence <coughs> in San Diego when I was Speaker of the House. San Diego and Tijuana are the most densely populated border. It turned out it worked. It worked dramatically. Duncan Hunter will be glad to testify, as former chairman of the National of the Defense Committee, how much it worked. However, it stopped. It stopped in part because there was a wetlands. It turned out none of the illegal immigrants cared about wetlands policy. Then you had to go and build around the wetlands, which we did. The further we have gone with the fence, the fewer the people have, have broken into California. Now, the, the thing that was fascinating though, John, is you quoted a government study of how much it would cost. That's my earlier point. If you modernize the federal government so it's competent, you could probably do it for 10% of the cost of that study. The fact is, what I would do, I, would, I, have, a, I have a commitment at Newt.org to, to finish the job by January 1, 2014. I would initiate a bill that would waive all federal regulations, requirements, and studies. I would ask Governor Brewer here, I would ask Governor Martinez, Governor Brown, and Governor Perry to become the co-leaders in their state. We would apply as many resources as are needed to be done by January 1 of 2014, including, if necessary, there are 23,000 Department of Homeland Security personnel in the D.C. area. I'm prepared to move up to half of them to Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. This is a doable thing. Cheerful.
Yes. Well, first of all, this is two different questions. General Dempsey went on to say he thought that Iran was a rational actor. I can't imagine why he would say that. Uh, I mean, I just cannot imagine why he would have said it. The, f the fact is, this is a dictator, Ahmadinejad, who has said he doesn't believe the Holocaust existed. This is a dictator who said he wants to eliminate Israel from the face of the earth. This is a dictator who said he wants to drive the United States out of the Middle East. I'm inclined to believe dictators. Now, I, I think that it's dangerous not to. If, if an Israeli prime minister, haunted by the history of the Holocaust, recognizing that three nuclear weapons is a Holocaust in Israel, if an Israeli prime minister calls me and says, I believe in the defense of my country, this goes back to a point that Congressman Paul raised that we probably disagree on. I do believe there are moments when you preempt. If you think a madman is about to have nuclear weapons and you think that madman is going to use those nuclear weapons, then you have an absolute moral obligation to defend the lives of your people by eliminating the capacity to get nuclear weapons. Cheerful. <laughs> but that's Syria. Mr. Speaker, then Governor Romney, if you were president today, what would you do differently from this president tomorrow? Well, look, the first thing I do across the board for the entire region is create a very dramatic American energy policy of opening up federal lands and opening up offshore drilling, and re replacing the EPA. We, we, the Iranians have been practicing closing the Straits of Hormuz, which has one out of every five barrels of oil in the world going through it. We have enough energy in the United States that we would be the largest producer of oil in the world by the end of this decade. We would be capable of saying to the Middle East, we frankly don't care what you do. The Chinese have a big problem because they ain't going to have any oil. But we would not have to be directly engaged. It's a very different question. But first of all, you've got to set the stage, I think, here to not be afraid of what might happen in the region. Second, we clearly should have our allies, this is an old-fashioned word, we should have our allies covertly helping destroy the Assad regime. There are plenty of Arab-speaking groups that will be quite happy. Uh, there are lots of weapons available in the Middle East. And I agree with, with the Senator Santorum's point. This is an administration which, as long as you're America's enemy, you're safe. You know, the only, the, the only people you got to worry about is if you're an American ally. Cheerful. <laughs> but that's, on that point, this is a conversation about what is the proper role of the federal government in the education issue, to the point the governor just raised about teachers' unions. Uh, you have complimented President Obama to a degree on that issue, saying he had some coverage, courage to stand up to the teachers' union. You went on tour with Al Sharpton and this president's education secretary in support of the multi-billion dollar race to the top program that is essentially, I think they use stimulus money for it, but incentives to states, to schools that perform and that enact reforms. What we did is we went around including Tucson in this state and we talked about the importance of charter schools which was the one area where I thought the president did, in fact, show some courage being willing to go into Philadelphia or into Baltimore or in a variety of places and advocate. We were in Montgomery, Alabama, for example, and say charter schools are an important step in the right direction. There are two things wrong with the president's approach. And, and the reason I would, frankly, dramatically shrink the Federal Department of Education down to doing nothing but research, return all the power under the Tenth Amendment back to the states. And I agree with Rick's point. I would urge the states then to return most of that power back to the local communities. And I'd urge the local communities to return most of the power back to the parents. I mean, I think the fact is we have, we have bought, we bought over the last 50 years three huge mistakes. We bought the mistake that the teachers' unions actually cared about the kids. It's increasingly clear they care about protecting bad teachers. And if you look at LA Unified, it is, a, it is almost criminal what we do to the poorest children in America in trapping them into places. No nation left behind said if a foreign power did this to our children, we declared an act of war because they're doing so much damage. The second thing we bought into was the, the whole school of education theory that you don't have to learn. You have to learn about how you would learn. So when you finish learning about how you learn, you have self-esteem because you're told you have self-esteem, even if you can't read the word self-esteem. And the... And the... And, and the third thing we bought, which, which Rick alluded to, which is really important,
We bought this notion that you could have Carnegie units and you could have state standards and you could have a curriculum everybody living. Every child is unique. Every teacher is unique. Teaching is a missionary vocation. When you bureaucratize it, you kill it. We need a fundamental rethinking from the ground up. Cheerful. <laughs> I think that the fact is that the American public are really desperate to find somebody who can solve real problems. I think that's why it's been going up and down and why you've had all sorts of different folks as front runners. Uh, and all I can say is that my background of having actually worked with President Reagan then having been speaker, if there was one thing I wish the American people could know about me, it would be the amount of work it took to get to welfare reform, a balanced budget, a 4.2% unemployment rate, and that you've got to have somebody who can actually get it done in Washington, not just describe it on the campaign trail. Cheerful.